Well, hello everyone. My name is Francis Ivernau, and I'm here today to present to you the Catch Me If You Can presentation, in which I'm going to show you how we were able to narrow down and define the number of techniques and categories malware families uses in order to evade every controlled environment. To provide a little bit of context, uh, this research and presentation was only made possible thanks to the help and tenacity of Ashlen Torello, who's present right here, thanks to uh, the helping hand of Enigma. Ashlen is a senior security researcher at Deloitte Argentina, and she's currently the leader of the Cuco Sandboard project, which was the helping hand needed in order to understand how malware are able to evade such environments. As I previously mentioned, my name is Francis Hibernau. I'm also a security researcher at, in Argentina. I'm part of, uh, of the Threat Library team, where I dedicate myself into the collection, analysis, and documentation of threat groups, my cyber incidents, and malware families. In order to do this presentation a little bit more uh, practical and easy to understand, we divided it into four different sections. The first one is going to be based on the Environment Awareness Master Technique, which uh, at the same time, uh, the purpose behind this whole research, which is going to be a pretty short one. Uh, in the second section, uh, I'm going to explain the five different categories within Environment Awareness and each of the techniques that we were able to define. At the same time, after each category, I'm going to show multiple malware families examples in order to show how they attempt to abuse such sub-techniques. Finally, I'm going to show how we were able to use what we learned in order to profile and track APT groups. To start off, uh, we need to understand that the attackers always desire that their malware pieces arrive to the, their desired victims. So they will attempt at all costs to avoid that their malware are, is going to be analyzed by security researchers. Nowadays, most malware families use at least one evasion technique in order to avoid this. This is why we needed to define a technique in order to understand how they are capable of doing this. And, how, and we also needed to define all methods and maneuver they use in order to detect one of three things. A sandboxing environment, a virtual machine, or the presence of any forensic tools. To start off, uh, I'm going to show you how we, uh, all the categories that we were able to define. Uh, we defined five different categories and every sub technique that is contained within. Uh, these, these techniques uh, can, wide, uh, can range in a wide uh, spectrum of complexity, uh, varying from a very simple and yet effective technique in order to discern if the system is real or not, to a way more complicated ones and sophisticated. Each category ends to a specific perspective of the system. And this is often abused by the malware in order to uncover the true nature and to see if the compromised system is trustable or not. By doing this, malware can also, uh, attackers can also uh, perform multiple tasks and in order to, uh, to show the malware true capabilities or hide it by executing a beneath behavior or abruptly ending its own execution. To start off, uh, we, defined, uh, we were able to define the system architecture uh, category, which aims to collect information about how the system is composed physically. The first of technique, system specifications, tries to get information about the methods uh, that rely on how the system is composed itself. As an example, we have the CPU core count, which is the number of CPUs a system has, the available RAM memory, or just some of these properties, such as the size or available partitions. Also, we have the system footprint, which is a pretty common one. It's when uh, malware uses uh, communication between system components and the uh, operating system, such as the basic input-output system, the BIOS, the Unified Extensive Firmware Interface, the UEFI, and the Extensive Firmware Interface, the EFI. Finally, we have the hardware components, which attempts to obtain information about the hardware itself, such as the thermal readings on a computer, uh, checking if the, the system has any printers, keyboards, or mouse, which would be a peripheral check, or checking the hardware IDs, such as the serial number, the model, or the manufacturer ID. In order to show a little bit of example, we took a Cisco Talos a report based on Gravity Rat. Gravity Rat is a pretty sophisticated remote access trojan that contains seven different innovation techniques in order to uh, discern whether the system is virtualized or not. In this case, uh, in system architecture, uh, the malware has three different techniques. 
The first one aims to obtain the thermal readings of the system. If, not, if, no, if no thermal readings are available or the, or the heat level is above normal, Gravity Rise is going to take it that a virtualized machine is being executed on the system and is going to exit. In the second technique, Gravity Rise aims to obtain the processor ID, the device ID, and the system name, and is going to compare the retrieved things against a blacklist in order to identify the name of any virtualization vendors, such as VirtualBox or VMware. The last technique, Gravity Rod aims to obtain the number of CPU cores that it ha the system has. In this case, if the number is equal to one, Gravity Rod is once again going to exit. The second category that we were able to define is system background. This is a pretty long one, sorry everyone. Uh, it's composed of six, six different sub-techniques, the first one being system architecture. Uh, in this category, all sub-techniques aims to perform any background-related verifications. In the first step technique, uh, the, uh, the malware attempts to obtain information about the communication between hardware components and with a specific inputs, is going to obtain information about the environment. As an example, we can have the CPU ID based instruction or the WMI queries. Following up, we have the process and services. This is a pretty common one seen uh, ac across multiple malware samples in which the malware attempts to look any, any suspicious uh, process running on the system and that is known to belong to a virtualization vendor. Additionally, we also have the registry keys, where the malware can look out for those registry keys that are known to be uh, related to a specific vendor, like this one, that is known to be from VirtualBox. A pretty sophisticated one, which is pretty neat, is the MAC addresses. Malware are able to obtain the MAC addresses available on the system. They can get this information and compare it once again to a, previous, a previously loaded blacklist. In this case, we can see a number of, of MAC addresses that Gravity Route uh, attempts to search in the system that are uh, related to the network adapter. We can also create a unique identifier of the system. This is mostly uh, seen on uh, generic profiles loaded into systems. Uh, in which the, the malware obtains to create a unique identifier of the system based on different information available on the compromised uh, environment. And at last, we have the artifacts process, where malware can check if any uh, suspicious tools or applications are installed in the system, like checking the available drivers. Once again, we have Gravity Rat, and in this case, Gravity Rat is using two WMI queries. In the first one, it's attempted to obtain information about the manufacturers of the system. It's going to search for the scene, the VMware, the VirtualBox, or just the name Virtual that is going to be suspicious. Gravity Rat also performs a WMI query down below there, in which it's going to compare it against a, uh, the BIOS, and it's going to compare the information against a blacklist once again, which we can see there, VMware, VirtualBox, et cetera. As I previously mentioned, Gravity Rate is also capable of retrieving the MAC addresses available on the system that are related to the network adapter. It's going to compare it to the blacklist, and it's going to discern whether it's going to exit or continue its own execution. And at the last, Gravity Rate is going to perform a registry key query, searching for any additional tools used by the hypervisor that is installed on the system. Malware also abuses a feature that is uh, present on the sandbox in environments, where the sandbox is going to execute and analyze malware's, uh, malware only for a short period of time. This is why malware often abuses this specific category. For example, the malware can sleep for a long period of time in order to delay its own execution. This is why they are going to abuse that limitation and they are going to escape those environments. Another way where malware can, can abuse this is using the Windows API called the get count in order to obtain the system uptime. If the system has been recently rebooted, it's going to uh, take it that as is a sandbox environment and it's going to once again exit. A pretty funny one, which is a time bomb, is some sort of a quote unquote good through, which is a date that the malware is going to be executed on. Let's say uh, the malware is going to be executed on the New Year's Eve only, Friday the 13th, or the April Fool's Day, and that's a real one. Also, malware can have used uh, a scheduling download. This is often seen in the first stage malware, where they, the first stage malware creates a scheduled download 
in order to delay the arrival of the second stage payload. And the last is system events, where malware will not execute itself after a certain trigger or event occurs that is unlikely going to happen in a sandboxing environment, such as a system reboot or a user logoff. As an example, we decided to use the Upeter family. I hope that I'm pronouncing that correctly. Sorry, everyone. Um, it's going, uh, in this case, we can see the instructions inside a debugger where the Upeter is using the Windows API get, get account. And it's going to compare that value, the obtained value against the 0AFE74, which is roughly 12 minutes. If the, if the value is less than 12 minutes, Upeter determines that the system is not trustable and is going to exit. Malware often abuses the fact that automated analysis lacks of human interaction. Real users tend to move the mouse, click, or type on their keyboard, which is defined as a user interaction. Sandboxing environments, in turn, run to, with little to non user uh, activity. A good example can be the fake installers that prompt the user to click multiple buttons or checkboxes. Also, checking the user properties and configuration, which is called once again, quote unquote, unquote, the mess of the user, is when the malware searches for documents available in the temp folder, recently opened documents, or shortcuts in the desktop. Finally, we have the, the software and applications, where the malware is going to attempt to obtain information ab about uh, applications that are installed in a system that are not going to uh, be likely installed in a sandboxing environment, such as a communication application, such as Skype, uh, email, uh, software such as Gmail or a video player. We need to know that uh, Microsoft Office documents such as PowerPoint are able to execute macros such as a PowerShell script. This is uh, often seen uh, over a mouse click or a mouse over an object in PowerPoint. In, in PowerPoint. We took another example from the financially motivated Fin7 group in which they prompt the user to click the document in order to execute the real macros behind that. And after clicking that, a decoy document is going to be displayed and the macros will start executing. The last category that we were able to define was the network based detection. This category aims to obtain information about all interconnected devices with the system itself. As an example, it's going to attempt to obtain information about the connectivity availability to see if the communication between the malware and the command and control server of the attacker is trustable or not. Also, it's going to attempt to obtain information about the open ports and search for those that are uncommonly used in order to see if they belong to a, virtualiz a virtualization vendor or a forensic application. And at last, it's going to, they can also perform a network check in order to see a, a, a complete list of users that are related to that specific network. And in order to obtain information such as the name of the, of the system, the OS version, or the related IPs. As an example, we decided to use the PowerShell Empire tool. This tool is pretty, pretty neat. Uh, it uses multiple situational awareness modules, and many of those are, uh, are based on the network check. In this case, PowerShell, uh, PowerShell Empire is running a user hunter in order to obtain a, a full list of users that are connected to the same network. It's going to obtain information such as the user, the computer name, or the related IPs. If no users are connected to the same network, uh, the malware is going to exit. As a result of this, uh, on the whole research, we were able to uh, get all malware samples that contain any uh, environment uh, awareness techniques. In this case, we saw that 30% correspond to threat groups that are suspected to be located in China, 28% from unknown origins, 12% are suspected to be from Russian origin, and 7.5% from North Korea. Additionally, we were able to identify the top player of each region, as well as their preferred category. In this case, we can see that APT1 often uses a sleeping uh, method that is going to be allocated into the time-based detection. TI-505 uses the system background. APT-28, which was heavily influenced by the PowerShell Empire malware, uses the network-based detection. 
and hide a hidden cobra, as well as APT1, prefer to use an extended slip, which is often related to the time-based detection. Also, uh, thanks to this research, Ashley and I were able to define a technique into our private framework, which was named environment awareness. This, is only made, this was only made in 2018. In 2019, MITRE ATT&CK updated their own framework, the one that we daily use. This framework was updated with the T1497 virtualization side observation technique, and we were able to provide feedback to them in order to complete it and have it up to date. Thanks to this, we were able to improve on the, on the APT inside knowledge. We were able to identify APT overlapping through multiple groups, as well as we learned how to detect these techniques and we gained that knowledge. As some closer remarks, we need to understand that the evasion techniques are constantly evolving. We need to stay aware, we need to keep on researching, and we need to keep uh, sharing this with the whole industry. We need to use different profiles for our sandboxes and avoid using generic ones. If we use generic ones, malware is going to be able to run a system fingerprint and is going to always avoid it. And at last but not least, is that we need to keep all system up to date in order to avoid malware exploiting and already known vulnerabilities. With, with all this, and a special thanks to Enigma, I say goodbye and welcome the questions.